Chancellor defends his tax rises and says no tax cuts until public finances allow. At the Conservative Party conference, Rishi Sunak makes it clear the difficult choices ahead. I have to be blunt with you. Our recovery comes with a cost. Meanwhile, the army starts delivering fuel to try to help the petrol station still running dry in the southeast. The Chancellor says despite the challenges, Brexit is in the long-term interest of the country. Also tonight, the big Tory party donor involved in one of Europe's biggest corruption scandals. After the Sarah Everard case, the head of the Met Police announces a review of police vetting standards. In the past hour, Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp have all gone offline in a major network blackout. And the loneliness of the long-distance runner, running up every mountain in Wales over 2,000 feet. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, a big week ahead for the future of the Ashes Tour as the England and Wales Cricket Board will meet to decide whether it will go ahead this winter. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. Rishi Sunak has defended recent tax rises, saying he wants to cut taxes, but only when the public finances are on a sustainable footing. In his first speech to the party conference in person as Chancellor, he also insisted that Brexit is in the long-term interest of the UK, making the economy more agile despite the challenges. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports from Manchester. No one wanted to give up a place in the queue. Not they weren't listening because they wanted to hear. Standing room ran out for the Chancellor, who let go of the purse strings during the pandemic. Emerging today to remind this crowd his instinct is not to tax or spend. Just borrowing more money and stacking up bills for future generations to pay is not just economically irresponsible, it is immoral. And whilst I know tax rises are unpopular, some will even say unconservative. I'll tell you what is unconservative. Unfunded pledges, reckless borrowing and soaring debt. But coming out of the COVID emergency has put new strains on the economy everywhere. The changes of Brexit have brought pressure too. We are facing challenges to supply chains, not just here, but right around the world. But tackling the cost of living isn't just a political soundbite. It's one of the central missions of this Conservative government. But making ends meet is getting harder for so many people. Like Leslie, she works at Manchester College, but paid five pounds to join this community grocer. Like Michelle, that means she can fill a basket for three pounds a week. This unusual kind of shop only opened a year ago. Its 10th branch is coming any day. The government needs to be looking at the real world mm. and the real people mm. that, that suffer if there isn't a meal on the table. Mm. It doesn't matter how many hours you work, it's not just about your food shop. You've got all your other aspects of the shop, you know, you've got like your mortgage payments, you've got rent payments, you've got gas, electric. Come to the end of the month, you're lucky if you've got any money left. One cabinet minister told me the government's walking a tightrope when it comes to people and the public finances being able to pay their way. And Rishi Sunak's future will be shaped by whether he can hold his balance. At just the moment when it feels like we've done enough, we must not stop 
Now is the time to show them that our plan will deliver. And now is the time, at last, at long last, to finally turn to the future. Thank you. Maybe it was a down payment on his own political future, trying to reassure the rank and file he's a low tax Tory. But it might get much harder in the coming months to reassure the crowd outside that the Tories are really on their side. Until your party took my democracy. Just as Jacob Rees-Mogg was confronted today, ministers can't turn their faces away. Even the most polished political script can be written in a moment by what happens in the real world outside. I know that. And Fiona, it was a big day for Rishi Sunak today, the man who's in charge of the nation's checkbook. And he was warmly received, but it was interesting. It wasn't a kind of massive barnstorming speech that was received with thunderous applause, even though the audience was clearly on his side. And you listening to him and talking to other ministers privately around the edges of this conference, it's clear that there is a real concern in government about those rising prices that people really are feeling in all parts of the country, about those supply stresses and strains that are making things very uncertain, and about what the Prime Minister hopes will turn into higher wages for people everywhere. But there's definitely a sense that that cocktail could mean there's some quite turbulent weather ahead. Laura at the Conservative Party conference, thank you. Well, while the Chancellor has admitted that the supply chain problems in the UK are likely to continue until Christmas, military personnel have begun trying to tackle one aspect of the resulting shortages, delivering fuel. While there's been a big improvement across much of the country, petrol stations in London and the South East are still running out. Our economics editor Faisal Islam has been assessing the economic backdrop to the Chancellor's speech. This is the army helping out in the distribution of British petrol, even as there are wider post-lockdown supply chain challenges across the globe, these scenes are unique to Britain. For the government, alongside some new visas for drivers, this is an example of what the Chancellor referred to as whatever it takes to deal with problems in getting goods to market normally. The latest figures show there has been a marked improvement across the UK, except in London and the South East where the petrol situation remains challenging. But the underlying haulage driver issue also remains. It's all very well saying improved pay and conditions. Next week, Boris will be whinging and whining that the inflation has gone crazy because everybody's paying twice as much for their drivers as they were six months ago. The Chancellor's speech did not contain any big new announcements. He'll have the chance to do so at this month's budget. The entire thrust of economic policy now seems to be about trying to raise wages. This is about particular sectors where there's a problem, where wages for a certain group of workers could go up. We also hope that there will be an increase in the national living wage that would help the lowest paid workers. But if in general we want pay to go up, we've got to be more productive. That means more investment in skills, more investment in companies. Farmers made their concerns clear outside the conference. Yesterday, the PM played down the prospect of a possible mass cull of pigs that farmers have blamed on a post-Brexit worker shortage. We don't want to see consumers going short of food and not being able to access high-quality British food. And we don't want to see farmers and growers going out of business because they cannot get their food to market. The Chancellor's long-term economic optimism faces some serious short-term challenges. The worker shortages and supply shortages are having a material impact on, for example, the Bank of England's forecasts for the economy, on household disposable income, on consumer confidence. And it's not just hauliers and farmers questioning whether the government's really doing whatever it takes to solve this issue. They were joined today by a prominent Conservative and Brexit-supporting retailer. The chief executive of Next, Lord Wolfson, said that cash alone cannot conjure up enough people and warned that forcing a rise in wages could simply lead to a 1970s style spiral of rising prices. The Chancellor is looking to a high tech future for the economy. Right now, there are real concerns about some ghosts from the past. Fazl Islam, BBC News. A BBC investigation has discovered how a major Conservative Party donor was involved in one of Europe's biggest corruption scandals. Leaked documents reveal how Mohamed Amersi, who's given half a million pounds to the Tories, worked on a series of controversial deals for a Swedish telecoms company. The Swedish company was later fined almost a billion dollars for bribery. 
Mr. Amersi denies any wrongdoing. The BBC worked alongside the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and The Guardian on the investigation. Richard Bilton reports. Mohamed Amersi is wealthy and well connected. Here he is talking about the dangers of corruption. Corruption is a very, very heinous crime. Every stolen dollar robs the poor of an equal opportunity in life. So where did Mr. Amersi's wealth come from? Some of it comes from this company in Sweden. A company fined almost a billion dollars for bribery. Telly was prosecuted over a corrupt telecoms deal. The firm paid $220 million to an offshore company secretly controlled by Gulnara Karimova, the daughter of the then president of Uzbekistan. The American authorities described it as a $220 million bribe. We've now obtained documents that show how Mr. Amersi was involved in the deal. In one email, Atelia Boss writes, I do not want to be involved in the day-to-day -day negotiations, so maybe you can handle it. Mr. Amersi responds, sure, I agree. And here's Mr. Amersi's invoice for his part in Project Uzbekistan. He got a success fee of $500,000 for his work. Mr. Amersi's lawyers said the offshore company had been vetted and approved by Telia and that its involvement did not raise any red flags to Mr. Amersi. We've also seen evidence about how he was involved in other Telia deals. We've got details of an internal report about a consultant referred to as Mr. XY who was paid more than $65 million by Telia. The payments included expenses for lavish corporate entertainment. They were usually between $100,000 and $200,000 a month and were not evidenced by copies of receipts. The internal report recommended Telia's relationship with Mr. Mercy be terminated. Who is Mr. XY? That is Mohamed Amersi. He has been involved in one of the biggest corruption scandals that we have seen in Sweden in modern times. It is important that people around him, that trust him, that listen to him, understand the whole context of his career and wealth. Mr. Amersi's lawyers said his fees and expenses were entirely in keeping with industry practice and that Tellier did not require regular sight of the receipts. They say it's entirely false to suggest his contract was terminated. All of this matters because Mr. Amersi has given more than half a million pounds to the Conservative Party. This morning, Boris Johnson gave his reaction. I see that uh, story today, but all I can say on that one is that all these donations are, are vetted in the, in the normal way in accordance with rules that were actually set up under, under the Labour government. So uh, we, we vet them the whole time. A Conservative spokesman said government policy is in no way influenced by the donations the party receives. They are entirely separate. We are motivated by the priorities of the British public acting in the national interest. Richard Bilton, BBC News. There's much more detail about the Pandora Papers and what they reveal on the BBC News website. And you can watch Panorama, Pandora Papers, Political Donors Exposed, tonight on BBC One at 7.35 and on iPlayer. WhatsApp, Instagram and Facebook are all down tonight in a major global blackout. Users have reported being unable to access all three apps that are owned by Facebook since about 5 o'clock this evening. Our correspondent John Donison has been monitoring developments. So John, what's happening? Well, we don't know, but we do know those services have been down now for over an hour, which is quite a long time. These outages, they do happen from time to time, but they're usually fixed uh, pretty quickly. Now, we actually think uh, these went down soon after half past four. Uh, people report started reporting this all over the world, so it does appear to be global. And of course, they have billions of users. Facebook alone has almost three billion users. We have had a statement through from Facebook. Uh, they had to put it out on Twitter, their great rival, of course. Uh, we're aware that some people are having trouble accessing our apps and products. We're working to get things back to normal as quickly Hello as possible. And, and we apologise for any inconvenience. Lots of people tonight looking at their phones. Well, they won't. They'll be looking at something else. Facebook shares down about 5%. Yeah, John, thank you. A Metropolitan Police officer has been remanded in custody after being charged with raping a woman he met on a dating app. St Albans Magistrates Court heard that PC David Carrick, who's 46, emphatically denies the allegation. Mr Carrick was off duty at the time of the alleged offence in September last year and is currently suspended from duty. 
Well, London's top police chief, Cresta Dick, has announced an independent review into the Metropolitan Police's culture and standards in an effort to try to restore public trust in the force. The move follows the conviction of Wayne Cousins. He was a serving officer when he kidnapped, raped and killed Sarah Everard in March. Cressida Dick says she won't resign over the incident, but that national police vetting standards should be looked at. She was talking to our special correspondent, Lucy Manning. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner on patrol this morning on the same streets that some women feel scared to walk down alone at night. She and her force have been rocked by Wayne Cousins' crimes, now promising to restore trust in her first interview since Cousins was sentenced. Your officer kidnapped, raped and murdered a lone female, Sarah Everard. You were his ultimate boss. It was on your watch. Why won't you resign? So these events have been absolutely dreadful. They have made everybody in the Met furious uh, and uh, we depend on public trust. So today I am announcing that we will be doing a review that will be led by a high profile independent person and they, the review will look at our internal culture and it will look at our professional standards. Some people will say that that's not enough that you need to go. Did you offer to resign? People will be entitled to their opinion. I've got a job to do. I'm getting on with it. My job now is to lead the Met through a difficult time. Cousins, seen here the night he murdered Sarah, buying things to use in the attack. But could he have been stopped days earlier when the Met were investigating two incidents of indecent exposure? We have an independent Office of Police Conduct investigation. There's one thing I do want to say, which is that as far as I'm aware, and this needs to be assured by the IOPC, at no stage during an investigation into indecent exposure was a police officer identified. But how did Cousins join the Met's firearms unit when there had been a previous allegation of indecent exposure when he worked as an officer in Kent six years ago? What went wrong on vetting? So in terms of vetting, I think the public will be, rightly be very concerned. I have asked that there should be a review of national police vetting standards. Hello, Cousins wasn't re-vetted when he became a firearms officer, was he? Or when he joined the Met? I'm not going to discuss the details of this because it is actually for the IOPC to say what happened. But what I can say uh, is that there's been much speculation about a, 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 an incident in Kent. No person, uh, no police officer was arrested, charged, convicted, uh, at all. So the Met will allow itself to be examined, but it's not the public inquiry or the resignation some have called for. Lucy Manning, BBC News. Time has just gone a quarter past six, our top story this evening. The Chancellor has defended his tax rises and says no tax cuts until public finances allow. And still to come, the new rules coming in today which make it easier for travellers coming to the UK. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, a day after Watford sacked Cisco Munoz as manager, the club have confirmed that 69-year-old Italian and former Leicester City manager Claudio Ranieri as their new man in charge. How much graduates in England need to be earning before they begin paying back their student loans is currently being considered by the government. At the moment, anyone earning just over £27,000 a year starts to repay their debt. But with only 25% of students expected to pay back their loan in full, there are suggestions that the threshold could be reduced so that more students start repaying their debt. Our education editor, Branwyn Jeffries, has been talking to students in Staffordshire. <laughs> Growing up in Stoke, few go from school to university, half the rate of wealthier southern England, even though most graduates earn more. Students starting at Staffordshire will all pay fees of more than £9,000, from engineers who will earn high salaries to digital artists like Vincent in his final year, who doesn't think graduates should start repaying earlier. Computer science and engineering are pretty popular subjects, so I mean, I think they're okay to maybe pay that share, but then, you know, for more of the creative fields, it can definitely be a lot more demanding, again, because our salary is so low starting out. 
Emma should get work straight away in forensics, but says graduates need a bit of leeway in the first few years. There's so much stress surrounding that because you need to pay rent, you need to pay uh, the bills, you need to pay for food, you might have a car, insurance, and then on top of that you need to pay your loan. And now, at this point, obviously you don't need to think about that until you earn 27k a year, which is a decent amount of money a year. Today's students will repay their loans for 30 years after they graduate. How much they repay will depend on how much they earn. And at the end of those 30 years, we all pick up the bill for the unpaid loans, whether we went to university or not. And that taxpayer share of student loans has now reached more than 50% of the total value. When earnings hit just over £27,000, graduates repay 9% of income above that threshold. If it was lowered to 21 or 23,000, as some suggest, that would mean they start repaying sooner and repay more. Our employability the vice chancellor tells me it would penalise students getting a degree later in life. If they're already paying for a family and paying for a mortgage, can they afford to start repaying their student loan? as early as they might have to. And so there are challenges there, but there may be a balance we could have. We've been saying for some time now that maintenance grants are really important. Despite the debate about cost, more students have chosen to sign up in England this year. Brown and Jeffries, BBC News, Staffordshire. A nurse who's charged with murdering eight babies and attempting to murder 10 babies has pleaded not guilty to all the charges against her. Lucy Letby from Hereford worked at the Countess of Chester Hospital between June 2015 and June 2016. Ms Letby repeated not guilty to all 18 charges as she appeared via video link from prison in Peterborough. Hello, Her trial is due to begin in October to next year. Two American scientists who discovered how our bodies sense the warmth of the sun or feel the hug of a loved one have won the Nobel Prize for Medicine. David Julius and Arden Papaputian used chilli and wasabi to identify the sensors that enable the body to feel heat, pain and pressure. Our North America reporter James Clayton reports from San Francisco. The challenge that we set out to solve in the lab was to understand the molecules and signaling pathways that underlie our sense of touch. Professor Julius and his team set out to better understand how we experience the world to better understand how touch helps us experience everything from our morning coffee to a hug from a loved one. You might think it's pretty obvious when a cup of coffee is too hot or a drink is too cold, but scientists haven't actually understood fully how we experience those sensations. And that's why this research is deemed to be so important. Not only does it improve our understanding, but it could have huge implications for how we manage pain. The research initially came from investigating the burning sensation we feel from eating a hot chilli pepper. They experimented with the source of a chilli's heat, the chemical capsicum. They discovered the specific type of receptor that responded to capsicum. From there the team found other receptors that respond to things like pressure. Touch is one of the five senses, um, but it does something very special because most cells in our bodies communicate through chemicals, and yet these touch neurons have to sense physical stimuli, such as pressure and temperature, and in a way um, transform this information into a chemical signal that cells can understand. And no one really knew how this happened. Places like San Francisco are in the grip of an opioid crisis. In fact, more people died here in this city of drugs, mainly from fentanyl overdoses, than from COVID last year. The hope is that this research will allow scientists to create more targeted and perhaps even less addictive pain relief in the future. James Clayton, BBC News, San Francisco. Let's take a look at the UK's latest coronavirus figures. They show 35,077 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, meaning an average of 34,160 new cases per day in the last week. 
33 deaths were reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test, although some data has been delayed. It means on average 111 deaths were announced every day in the past week. The latest figures on those being treated in hospital and percentage of people vaccinated haven't been made available. Watford have appointed Claudio Ranieri as their new manager after sacking Cisco Munoz. Ranieri, who's 69, returns to the Premier League, which he famously won with Leicester in 2016. Now he's endured wild winds, storms and an injured ankle. But Will Rennick has finally completed his epic challenge to run up every mountain over 2,000 feet in Wales. That's a total of 189. He's covered more than 500 miles since beginning the run last month and says instant mash, noodles and chocolate bars have kept him going. Our Wales correspondent Howell Griffith reports. He's climbed every mountain had to cross a few streams too. At the end of Will's run up and down all 189 peaks across Wales, only one question remains. Why do it? I love exploring Wales. I can't get enough of it. I feel like I need to explore every nook and cranny just because I think we've got such a beautiful country and I just want to see every single bit of it. And then I saw a BBC News article about two guys who'd walked a route taking in every single mountain. And as soon as I saw that squiggly line going from south to north Wales, I thought, I've, I've got to do that. Will travelled light and on his own, but stayed social by posting online so that people could track his progress. He set off from Swansea back on September the 10th on a 500-mile route that wound its way up through the Brecon Beacons into Mid Wales, climbing a total of 100,000 feet by taking on the peaks of Snowdonia and working his way down after 23 days on foot to the finish line. Will was raising money for a mental health charity that helps people access the outdoors. Having walked the entire coast of Wales a few years ago, it's a place he feels at home, but he was still exposed to the elements. Been worried about him the entire time and fielding messages from his mum when she gets concerned as well. But he's had a GPS tracker with him, so I've been able to follow along his route, but I hadn't realised initially that he was switching it off every night, so every now and again there'd be a flashing exclamation mark and I would panic at those points. A relief then that every summit was scaled and Will can finally put his feet up. Time maybe to relax and start planning the next adventure. Howard Griffith, BBC News. As of today, if you're double vaccinated, you'll no longer need to take a COVID test before travelling into the UK, as the traffic light system is scrapped, though you will still have to take a PCR test and do two days after you get back. There will now be just one list of so-called red countries, and anyone travelling to them will have to quarantine for 10 days in a hotel when they return. Airlines say the changes will make going abroad cheaper and easier. Our consumer affairs correspondent Coletta Smith is at Manchester Airport for us this evening. This is good news for travellers, Coletta. It is, Fiona, yeah. Passengers touching down behind me have been greeted by a bit of Manchester drizzle, but at least, at least life is getting easier and cheaper for them when they return home now that that slightly confusing amber list system has been completely scrapped. This is a change, as you say, the industry has been calling for all summer. It's coming in at the very tail end of the holiday season, but in time for anyone who's booked a half-term getaway. Um, lots of families, of course, put off international travel this summer because the system seemed very complicated and was hugely expensive and a lot of faff trying to get all those tests completed. Now there is just one list of red countries and the rules have effectively stayed the same. If you're returning from one of those countries, you still need to isolate, you still need to test, you still need to pay to be in a quarantine hotel whether or not you've been vaccinated but for everywhere else in the world there is now just one test to do on day two when you're home and that's a PCR test as long as you're double jabbed if you haven't been fully vaccinated then the rules effectively stay the same for you as well we'll get an update on that red list later in the week on Thursday and we may see some changes to the countries added or removed from that list but for most destinations in the world planning a trip has now got a little bit less Less complicated and you'll be having to fork out a lot less for the process. Coletta at Manchester Airport, thank you. 
All right, let's take a look at the weather. Darren Bett is here. We saw a bit of Manchester drizzle there, but it's going to get nicer, isn't it, Darren? Later in the week, yes, no need to travel. It's going to get a bit warmer. Today, though, has been a day of sunshine and showers. Let me show you the uh, radar picture. We've had the showers actually moving into eastern England, but look what's happening here towards Wales in the southwest. We've got some heavier rain beginning to develop. It'll turn much wetter in Wales in the southwest this evening, and that rain gets a bit more organised, turns heavier, some bright colours there. That rain sweeps northwards and eastwards across England and Wales, accompanied by some very gusty winds all keeping the temperatures up it does turn drier for northern ireland and for scotland northern scotland could be quite chilly temperatures close to freezing by the end of the night but tomorrow we've still got this uh, wetter weather it soon moves away from um, east anglia in the southeast more rain gets blown into uh, southeastern parts of scotland wet for much of northern england north wales for a while pushing into the midlands all wrapped around a deepening area of low pressure bringing some strong winds especially where we've got that rain making it feel particularly chilly elsewhere there'll be some sunshine southern parts of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Western Scotland should be turning uh, drier here, but temperatures only the mid-teens at very best. So the warmer weather yet to arrive as we head beyond then, that area of low pressure is eventually going to push away into continental Europe, a brief ridge of high pressure and then the next weather system coming in from the Atlantic. Heading into Wednesday, still windy for eastern parts of England to begin with. The cloud and showers move away, the winds drop, sunshine comes out for a while, but already we see the cloud thickening out to the west and rain arriving into Northern Ireland. But ahead of that, for England and Wales at least, temperatures should be a bit higher on Wednesday, but there's warmer weather still to come. There's some rain in the forecast too. This weather front will focus some rain mainly into Northern Ireland and into Scotland. We've got high pressure towards the southeast of the UK, and that means a southwesterly wind, bringing in some tropical maritime air, and temperatures could reach 19 or 20 degrees as early as Thursday. Hurrah. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> a reminder of our top stories this evening. The Chancellor has defended his tax rises and says no tax cuts until public finances allow. And Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp have all gone offline this evening in a major network blackout. That's all from the BBC News at six. It's goodbye from me and on BBC One. We can join the BBC's news teams where you are. Bye-bye.